The ultimate evidence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is not signs, miracles, wonders, gifts, tongues, faith, hope, or holiness. The greatest evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit in us is love. There are three things that will endure, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Love is how the world knows we are followers of Jesus. Love motivates us to minister to the least and the most difficult of these, and in doing so, to serve and love Jesus. Love inspires two great commandments that Jesus gave to us. Love agape, that is selfless, unconditional, and completely giving, is impossible without the help of the Holy Spirit. He pours God's love out of our hearts. For we know how dearly God loves us, because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. When the Holy Spirit fills us with love, every fear, every worry flees. This is God 321. And now, here's your host, Danny Hutchins. Dan Hutchins, God321.net. Whoa, gosh, it's good to see you out there again. I want to say hello, Maddie Wood. From Detroit, thank you for your note and thank you for your kind, your kind thoughts about the program. I really appreciate that. Today we're here uh, with Pastor Mark Shell. Mark Shell is going to talk about fear, about worry, about how, how you cannot, should not fear because God is with you. You know, when God is with you and for you. You know, fear has to be gone. And when we talk about fear, fear and faith cannot exist in the same place. When you are fearful and when you are worrying, you cannot, you cannot be, have faith. They just don't exist. You say, well, I'm a person of faith. But if you're full of fear and you're full of worry, and I know times are tough. And when you don't have the money for groceries, you don't have money for rent, you don't have money for food and water. But when you when you don't fear, when you give your fear to God, when you let him take that yoke off you and have faith, then he can go to work. He can go work to to help you. He will go to work to help you. He will not leave you. He goes before us, you know, fear vanishes. So Mark Shell is going to talk to you today about dismissing fear, about having no fear, finding a place when you are totally not fearful, when we really are his servants and we allow him, him to fill us and we would give everything to him. We have to let go of self, self is fearful self the self you know the enemy wants you to swallow in fear because he came what adam and eve adam and eve went and hid after they sinned they went and hid they were full of fear that's exactly what satan wanted for them to be full of fear he wants you to be full of fear but you have to find a place when you give it all to him give all self to him empty yourself out fear and worry and he, he will fill you with peace. You have the Holy Spirit in you. He will, is peace. He is truth. He is joy. He's love. He fills you. You give up your fear. You receive love. You receive joy. You receive peace. Now, we need to recognize that the Holy Spirit is here today. He is here with us on this planet. He's been here 2,011 years. Christ said, it's better that I go, that I send the helper. He has sent the helper. The helper is peace. The helper is joy. The helper is happiness. And Mark's going to tell you about that. He's going to talk to you. And Mark uh, is a pastor, Oklahoma, and he's been with us right on air and you'll find his words exciting, and they are uh, full of revelation. They, it will change your mind. It will change your mind. And he not only talks about just your fear of, 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 of living and the daily fear, but also that God heals. And when we give up our feel, he can hear you. He can heal you. He will heal you when you understand that Jesus has already paid for that. It's all been paid for, all been paid for. Christ has paid it all. We are going to hear from Mark Shell and talk to you right after. 
we're dealing with adjusting our faith to the degree that we don't fear anymore. Fear is evidence of unbelief, and unbelief negates the will of God in your life. Unbelief is the only element that can keep the will of God from a believer's life. The devil has nothing to do with your defeat. Nothing. I know there's a lot of songs out there about how big and bad the devil is, but the Bible says he's just an adversary. The word adversary just means one who questions your identity. And so if if what I believe does not allow me to live a carefree lifestyle, then I may, may need to change what I believe. Because you're the, your belief system is the only thing that promotes or negates the blessings of God in your life. Second Timothy, the first chapter, the sixth verse, Therefore, Paul said to Timothy, I remind you to stir up, recollect, recount, get knowledge of, rehearse, plot, ploy, meditate, stir up the gift. This is the gift. The gift given to mankind was righteousness. Stir up the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of righteousness. Stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a mental disposition of fear, timidity, hesitation, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Where are we trying to get? We're trying to get to the place we have no fear. And and I want to say this at the onset. I am not trying to take away heaven from you. I am not trying to take the fact that Jesus is coming back from you. I'm not trying to take away your streets of gold, your walls of jasper, your gates of pearl. What I am trying to take away is your mentality of having to die or be raptured in order to start really living the God kind of life. 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, the first verse, the Bible says, well, Paul taught it, Moses taught it, and Jesus taught it. Let everything be established out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. But he said, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Now, that's a pretty fearless statement, isn't it? Paul was saying, if you want to see somebody that lives like Christ in His power and authority, do what I do. Follow me as I follow Christ. He said in another text, therefore be imitators of God as dear children. To imitate God means to mimic, to act like, to think like, and to talk like. That is our journey in life. We are trying to become, in our thinking, imitators, not imposters. The message that I teach of equality is not a message that the religious handle well because they say it is a message of heresy and blasphemy. And, and many people would say, well, now, Mark, I don't want to assume uh, too much about myself. You know, Satan tried that and Lucifer was cast down for doing that. But have you ever stopped to think that's why he hates us so bad is because we were invited to the throne and he was not. I have no problem saying I am a God in this world. If that offends you, you live in fear. What's this? Just a few things the Lord put in my heart. A believer who fears is one who has yet to experience death. 1 Corinthians 15, the 26th verse. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. The last enemy that will be destroyed in your life is death. Before you truly and completely walk in freedom. Hear me. God began to put some stuff in me. I was up about 2 o'clock this morning. He started pouring some things in me. You understand, I used to work in a cemetery. I've been around dead people. Then when I got in the ministry, I preached in a lot of cemeteries before I got rid of all of them that didn't want to grow. Revelation has a tendency of separating the sheep from the goats. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Now, I want to back up just a moment, and I I want to give you some instruction. There are some very important principles that must be understood concerning 
this Bible and why it was given to the believer. Number one, when you study the Bible, you've got to understand it was written for us, not to us. It was written for us, not to me. That is not depleting nor demeaning the validity of it. What it is saying is this. It was written to people centuries ago, and where people get in trouble is they try to make pertinent for today what was spoken into a culture then. The Bible was written for us, not to us. Well, you mean the Bible's not for me, Mark? That's not what I said. It was written for us. It just wasn't written to us. Whoever takes the letter as theirs has become inheritors of the promise. Very important to understand. Next thing you need to understand, the reason the Word of God was given to us was to perpetuate His person through us on the earth. I'm tired of this book just being preached as a way to escape hell. The reason this was given to us is to perpetuate His person through us on the earth. The Scriptures were given for us to awake the spiritual man in us by killing the old nature around us. The Bible is a book of instruction on how to die and be made alive again. Simply stated, the Bible is to correct our thinking that we have to exist in this life with trouble and sorrow until one day we face that final enemy called death, then we really get to start living. The Word teaches us that He was our substitution. John the 10th chapter, the 10th verse. Many of you don't even have to turn there. You know it once I said the reference to it. The thief comes not but for to steal, to kill and destroy, but I have come to give you life. And if you've studied that out, the devil is not the thief. He was talking about the religious world that was trying to steal the miracle of the blind boy he just healed. The thief of the world is religion. Religion, very simply stated, is man's efforts to please a holy God. Religion tries to get you to God. Revelation brings God to you. Life after death will either be an experience later for you or an existence for you right now depending on how you understand the works of Jesus. Life after death can either be something you exist in now or you can wait for the experience. In the 31st verse, you're probably still there in 1 Corinthians 15, the 31st verse, Paul said, "...I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord..." I die daily. How many times has the Word only been used to try to prepare people to die physically instead of dying to a sin consciousness? Because as long as you live in a sin consciousness, you live in fear. Yes, you do. Death by definition, and you you study the book, you study it for yourself, But death by definition, when you study the word death in the word, more times than not, it talks about the figurative sense of it and not the physical sense of it. By definition, in the original language, death means a region enveloped in the darkness of ignorance and sin. It has nothing to do with your heart stop beating, your lungs collapse, and you have no pulse. Death in the Scripture is referring to a person who is enveloped by a sin consciousness. Now remember, I'm not taking your heaven away from you. I'm just trying to give you some life right now. Because many people think they've got to be six foot under to really start living. And because the message has been so perverted... People have delayed believing they're healed now. Well, if I don't get it here, I'll get it over there. You ought to be having it right now. Death is simply ceasing to acknowledge a fallen state in which judgment is pending. 
When I die to something, it means I no longer acknowledge a fallen state with judgment pending. It's very important to understand, we've already been judged. Do you realize righteous is a verdict, just like guilty or not guilty? Righteous is a verdict. In the court system, a verdict is rendered after both sides have been heard. Righteous is a verdict. Your trial is over. You've already been judged. How do I know that? You read John 12 sometime, the 27th verse. Jesus said, Now my soul is troubled, but what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, but for this purpose I came to this hour. And you continue to read down in that, and around the 30th, 31st verse, He said, what's this? Now the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up on the cross, I will draw all... I know it says men. That's not what it says in the original text. He said, if I be lifted up on the cross, I will draw all judgment to myself. That's the reason these numbnut preachers that get up saying God's judging the homosexual with a hurricane, Rita uh, uh, in New Orleans, they're idiots. Either Jesus took all the judgment or He didn't quite do what He was supposed to do. I choose to believe, let every man be a liar, but let God be true. And the very fact He says I'm righteous means, Mark, I've already judged you, and in May of 76, I accepted that verdict, and I have passed judgment, and I am living in eternal life right now. Eternal life just means unstoppable power. Well, I'm looking forward to dying so I can see the Lord. Oh, my God. Death is the act of separating from the old consciousness of sin to the new creation status. To die is to declare something or someone has ceased to exist. Death in the Scripture has much more implication to the cessation or termination of the sinful disposition of man than it does concerning merely the physical passing of man. How can a believer live in fear? Because they haven't died yet. You can never have a res. I've always wondered, how can somebody be a believer and not live the resurrected life? You've got to die first. You've got to die to a sin consciousness. How are you doing? Oh, it's bad. That just means you're not dead yet. The truth is, you've got to die to live. Death, physical death, was never intended to be the only passage to see God. Physical death. Oh, you know, when I, when they put me in the ground, throw dirt on me, then I'm going to see him face to face. <laughs> Why don't you see him now? Now, I know this is smoking some cows. And remember, I'm not taking your streets of gold and your gates of pearl. And I'm not taking the coming of the Lord from you. And I'm not taking heaven from you. What I'm saying is while you're here, why don't you win? And the only way to win is to live without fear. And the only way to live without fear is get rid of the mentality, I've got to die to see God. Death is to be separated from God. Life is to be joined together with Him. I'm going to say it again. Death is to be separated from God. Life is to be joined together with Him. In 1 Corinthians 15, the 34th verse, it says, Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So not having the knowledge of God is sin. Sin is not dipping snuff. Sin is not drinking a beer. Sin is is when a believer has no knowledge of God. You're telling me I can drink and dip. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when you die, you don't want to. Nothing about God wants to destroy the temple. Spiritual death is the state of being separated from the relationship or the right to rule. Spiritual life is the state of being dead to the ignorance of sin, which is no relationship. We must say it with me. I must die in order to live. So when I speak tonight of dying and death, I'm saying you've got to die to that sin consciousness because it's sin consciousness that's producing fear and fear is evidence unbelief is present and unbelief is negating the will of God in your life. Mark, can I get to the place I just can't fear? Yes, you can. 
but it's only available when you sit in the heavenly places. And you don't have to die physically to get there. Death is the act of no longer recognizing the fallen state that was unable to please God and sit with Him. You do not, I I want to emphasize this so much, and I wish every religiously constipated person would hear this message. You don't have to physically die to experience eternal life. You simply have to lose the consciousness of a fallen state. The resurrected life doesn't mean you walk around on air. The resurrected life means I don't let what I've been through mess me up. It has no hold on me anymore. Paul said, lay aside every weight and every chain and every fetter that so easily besets you. He said, the life I now live, I live it just like Jesus. He said, I act so much like Christ, just follow me. He's not here. (gasps) He's not. No, he, no, Jesus is gone. Matter of fact, he left us so equal to him, he felt he could go, the earth would be okay. That's how equal you are to Jesus. He left. When I was studying this out, because being raised in church, I thought, no, wait a minute, Lord. There's, there's some things I need to clear up, and it was this. Life is having a relationship with the Father. Death is not having a relationship with the Father. Death is not the stopping of a heartbeat. Rather, it is to live in a place of darkness enveloped by ignorance of His death. Life is not just a heartbeat and a pulse. It's to live in and function daily in the realm of understanding that He has accepted you just as you are. Isn't that nice you didn't have to change for Him to love you? He takes you just the way you are. Any teaching that says you've got to do something different other than just believe for God to accept you is a message of the Antichrist. And I don't care if they got REV or Bishop in front of their name. If they're not preaching righteousness by faith, it is a doctrine of devils. The reason Jesus came was to separate Himself for you, to become like you, so that He might live through you. The reason He came for you was so that He could live through you. When He died, you died. I used to sing, I should have been crucified, and then I figured out I had been. I was crucified with Him. I was buried with Him. I was raised with Him. And I also ascended with Him. Same position, two different places. As He is now, so are we right here. He is fully ascended and fully resurrected, and so are you. So why does the church think they have to die to see God? You don't have to die physically to see God. When He was raised, mankind was raised. To live, you must die to acknowledge to the acknowledgement of your failure. The only thing that separates the believer from the throne is death. You know, one of these days... I'll see all my friends at Hallelujah Square. And what a wonderful time we'll all have up there. Just a few more weary days till then. I'll... Don't ever sing that crap in my presence. It is so anti-Christ, it's ridiculous. To think you've got to fly away to see the God who lives in you is an asinine doctrine of people who have listened to demons and not the Holy Spirit. The sting of death is literally the hopelessness of acceptance. The victory of the grave is the inability to be pleasing according to performance. Paul said Jesus took away the sting of death. Your acceptance is not hopeless, it's hopeful. You know what that word means? Absolutely expected. He accepts me. He accepts me. Therefore, eternal life is unstoppable existence in His presence as His person. Now, I'm taking a little time here and I'm giving you some stuff. One brick after another, it's coming down. And people will not be so anxious to die If you've ever wondered, how can somebody go to a word of faith, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, aisle-running, bench-jumping church, and when something goes wrong, they just compromise and accept defeat. Well, I'll get it when I get there. It's because they have misunderstood. I misunderstood it for years. 
But now that I know different, Paul said, if you learn truth different, you are worse than an infidel if you don't share it. Therefore, I don't, I don't preach and teach in the fear of man and what they're going to give me in the offering. I'm going to tell you the truth. And the truth is, Jesus died. He rose from the dead so that you could have access to the throne at any given moment you want to in your life without having to die to do it. There is no fear in His presence and only death separates you from His presence. I must begin to stop thinking I have to leave the planet to see God. I'm just trying to get to the place fear can't touch me. And this is one of the primary principles you and I must understand. You don't have to leave the planet to see God. God. I need to stop thinking eternal life begins after earthly life. I need to stop thinking the way to His presence is through the grave. Jesus said, and I didn't finish uh, quoting it, but in John 10.10, He said this. He said, The thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and that you might have life more abundant. Now, how many believes Jesus lived in the abundant life? Okay. How many believes Jesus, He was always in touch with the third heaven? Do you, do you believe that? This is the abundant life that Jesus led. Now remember, everything He did was to be an example to us. So if He could live it, you can live it. The abundant life He lived was this. He got His counsel from the third heaven on a daily basis. The enemy was under His feet because He was righteous. The Father glorified Him because He was righteous. The angels waited on Him to speak because He was righteous. This is the abundant life. It's not hallelujah square one day. It's the life you can have right now. This is the fearless life. Sickness couldn't touch Him. Jesus had to become sick because sick couldn't touch Him. Well, now, Mark, he was God. Well, be imitators of God. He had to become sick. He had to become poor. Every we were, he had to become because he was not. And he created you and me in his image, so I have to become that. And fear is the door that leads to the life of it. The abundant life was the enemies were, uh, were his footstool. What's that mean? He rested his authority. Your feet, your authority. The footstool is to rest your authority. His enemy was his footstool. The abundant life that Jesus lived was his accusers were silenced. Mark 1, the demons didn't speak because they knew who he was. The accusers were silenced because he was righteous. He was anointed in full portion because he was righteous. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might become righteous. Righteous people are supposed to live this abundant life. A Christian life is not about getting to heaven. It's about walking in heaven. How do I start to live this God kind of life? Because He lives, I live. In Revelation 1.17, John said, When I saw Him, I fell at His feet as a dead man. In other words, my operating from the throne is directly connected to my ability to lose my sin consciousness. How much I talk like Him is a reflection of how much I think like Him. Now, the Word says that, again, read the whole chapter sometime, but in Romans 6, He said, Now, if we believe we were we died with Him, then we were also baptized into His death. We, we were buried with Him. We were raised with Him. And, and we have ascended with Him, according to Colossians 1.20 and Colossians uh, 2.6. We have ascended with Him. So Paul says, the life I now live, I live according to the faith of Jesus Christ. The last enemy that you and I have to conquer is conquering that mindset of a sin consciousness. 
Death is the last enemy. That is the only thing that would keep me living in fear is if I have not died to a sin consciousness. Sitting on the sofa last night, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, why don't you eulogize the old man? Years ago, whenever I worked in the cemetery, I, I did a lot of funerals and I did, gave a lot of eulogies and, and things like that. And I began to go down and, and I eulogized the death of the old man. It would read something like this. He was birthed by confusion and born through shame. He was stubborn in his effort to try and attract God's goodness and favor with his, with his performance. He tried his best to be good, but was never good enough. He was a very prideful man who always wanted recognition for his efforts at righteousness through good works. He was very intimidated by the knowledge of his failure. I'm talking about the old man. See, if any of these are still at work in you, you haven't died yet. He never knew what it was to dwell in the secret place. He had no clue what it was like to sit on the throne. He always felt out of place when love showed up to talk with him because of his inferior distance in life. His presence was not welcome in the sight of the Holy One due to the stained memory of his shortcomings. I'm talking about the old Mark that died. He was a person who was emotionally driven, therefore you never knew how his demeanor, uh, how he was going to respond to any given situation. His existence was solely for himself, being wrapped in pride and warped by pity. He needed the constant attention of others to make him feel good about himself. Ask your neighbor, are you dead yet? How many's ever let somebody hurt your feelings? It's just proof we're not dead yet. The low self-esteem of this old man was a gift uh, to him from those around him who he allowed to assess his worth. He was a very confused being, not knowing if he was doing the right thing or not. He was a very nervous man, always afraid he wasn't good enough. He was the hardest man for anyone to be around because he was so selfish and self-centered. This old man thrived on what was happening in the natural world and could never understand the spiritual things of God. He would always boast about how much better he was than others trying to destroy someone else's image in order to build his own up. He would avoid anyone who had a need because he was afraid of being used by others. And he would never help anyone unless he knew them and liked them. Do you know how many churches have not died? Well, we, we can't allow you here because you live a lesbian lifestyle. Get over it. We can't allow you here because you're of the homosexual nature. We're going to have to get over it. Well, we can't allow you here because you haven't really formally gotten married. You are, I used to call it shacking up, but now we're in a politically correct society, cohabitating. So we, we can't allow you here. Do you realize most churches wouldn't have Moses preach because he married a black woman? Most people wouldn't have Paul preach because he, he uh, was a murderer and he was an accuser. You, you, un you understand that. Most churches would not have the patriarchs of old to preach. They wouldn't have Samson preach because they haven't died yet. They are still judging the new man according to the old man. I mean, tonight, you've got, to have a, you've got to have a funeral for that old man and say, you know what, I'm not waiting till I'm 90 or 100 years old to see my God. I'm dying tonight, and I'm going to live in the abundance of life where I can be caught up at any given moment, get in the secret place, and descend and minister in the earth at any given time. Fear is the only thing that keeps me from the abundance of life, and the only thing that can keep fear alive in me, the last thing, is death to a sin consciousness. This old man's greatest fear was that of death because death seems so final. He'll not be missed. Quite frankly, I'm sorry he ever existed. He couldn't help. He was here. Someone else allowed his entrance. 
Just as he was forced by a man's decision to live, he has been forced by another man's decision to die. He'll all, he's always said the only way he would leave would be if someone crucified him. Well, someone did. And today, I celebrate the passing of one and the coming of another. I declare it is no longer this old man living, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life that I live now, I live by the faith of the Son of God. You, you hear what I'm saying? Death is the last enemy for you to conquer before you enjoy ruling from the throne. Don't wait on a physical death. For me to live free from fear is the ultimate glory I can give to the one who set me free from the old man. I said all of that to say this. Paul answered it. How to die. Awake to righteousness. Awake to righteousness. I, I had a, a young lady not long ago email the ministry and, and she said... I, I'm a preacher's daughter. I've been raised in church all my life, but I don't know where to start studying the Bible. I said, read who Jesus was, and you're just like Him. Think like Him. Do things like Him. Talk like Him. You, you hear what I'm saying? Jesus didn't die and raise from the dead just so you could go to heaven. He died and rose from the dead so you could live in the heavenly realm on the earth. And I'll, I'll say it again. I'm not trying to take heaven from you and streets of gold and gates. Of, I'm not trying to take it from you. But we need to understand all these people that's just promoting you need to get saved so you can get to heaven. No, you need to get saved so you don't have to live in fear anymore of what once was. Because that by one man's disobedience, sin entered, but by another man's obedience, Righteousness has come. And since you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, let me ask you this. When is the last time you were in heaven? No, I could ask you, how long have you been saved? And many of you would say, oh, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years or more. But the, what is the last time in all those years you sat and talked with Him in the heavenly place? Because, see, the Word says, when we see Him we will be like Him. When we see Him, is He healthy? Then if you can see Him, you'll be like Him. Is He wealthy? Then when you see Him, you'll be like Him. The last enemy that is keeping you from everything that God has for you is dying to the sin consciousness that you don't deserve it and you've got to wait till you get there to enjoy it. It's an enemy. And that propaganda is found in most songbooks that's behind the seat in most churches. It's taken me some time, but I've had to crucify that old man. I've had to crucify the flesh. Do you ever get to the place where... No, Paul said, I have to do it every day. In other words, when he said, I die daily, he was saying, every day I wake up expecting to have a moment in the presence of God, and He gives me His plans and His thoughts for the day. He puts in me the words I need to say to be ministry in the earth. He tells me where He's leading me. I don't walk around in a fog wondering, God, what am I doing? He shows me what He's going to do with my life. He'll do that. He did it for Jesus. He does it for me. He'll do it for you. So Jesus' coming was more than us just going to heaven. It's so we can live this abundant life where the enemy is our footstool. Well, He came so you could have eternal life. Well, He did. But eternal life doesn't start when you die on the earth. Eternal life starts when you say, All right, Lord, I'm tired of this old man full of pride, self-centeredness, and hopelessness. I'm tired of him ruling my life. And tonight, I choose you. And by choosing you, I denounce that old man. And when the enemy tries to remind me and resuscitate that old sin consciousness, this is why you need a prayer language. 
You cast down every thought and high thing that's trying to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. People who live the resurrected, ascended life talk to the problem and not about the problem. The Word says, He that the Son has set free is totally free. Well, Mark, I've just got this blessed hope that Jesus is coming back. Well, that's a blessed fact. He's coming. He's coming. But it was some people, they just got saved. And, you know, they used to do country music, and I like country music, but they got saved. So now they're writing gospel songs. You know, basically it's Jesus is coming back, and he's mad. He's not mad. See, understand, I know he's coming back. My blessed hope is not that He's coming back. My blessed hope is I will be like Him when He appears. And the only way I can be like Him is if I see Him. And the only way I can see Him is through death. Do you know how many people... Well, well, Mark, do I have a sin consciousness? Do you find yourself still feeling bad and guilty, shamed and condemned over something that was in your former state? Then you need to die. You need to give yourself a, a, a burial. Stop living, stop identifying with things that are cursed. You become what you identify with. To live a fearless life is to get rid of a sin consciousness. When you truly get rid of a sin consciousness, you will speak from the first party and not the third party anymore. There'll be no no more of this, I'll be holding you up. I'll be praying for you. God's going to touch you. It's one and the same. It's one and the same. I think God's people ought to live healthy. Well, now, Mark, I got you there because the Word says uh, it was appointed a certain man uh, wants to die and after death, the judgment. The original language, it was appointed a certain man of male gender wants to die and after his death, the judgment. Look at your neighbor. Would you do that? Look at him. You are looking at a person who has already passed judgment and been found accepted. He's accepted you. Well, you've got to clean up your life. No, no. You've got to clean up your mind, and then your life will clean up. See, the church has tried to take the position, we're here to straighten people's lives out. No, you're not. You're here to help people realize, you know what? If you never changed, He wouldn't change loving you. But because you understand how much He loves you, you want to change. If I'm making you do something, you're going to fight me the whole way. If, 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 if you're married and all you do is stay on your spouse, you're less likely to get them to just do things for you. See, th- that's what marriage does. It causes a dying to self. That's what we've done with God. We've entered into a covenant To where we have died to self, it's not me living, it's Him living. When I speak, I speak from the throne. My body is here, but my dominion is everywhere. I can speak from Missouri and Africa. I can speak from California and affect New Zealand. Why? Because my authority is omnipresent. Well, how do you know what to say? I'm married to omniscience. And all the gifts of the Spirit are ours. So when Paul said, the last enemy is death, all he was saying is, if you want to live from the throne in this earthly life, you're going to have to conquer the sin consciousness. Mark, how do do I die to that sin consciousness? Don't entertain it. That's how you die to something. Don't entertain it. How many has ever said, now, I've told you when you do that, you make me mad. And guess what? If that person wants to make you mad, guess what they're going to do? How did they know to do it? Because we told them. Well, you just know how to get my goat. Quit telling them where you tie your goat up at. You, you see what I'm saying? Don't you know the enemy knows what buttons to push in you? Why does the enemy throw our past up to us because it's the only DNA he has left to identify you with the old man. So when you don't entertain the thoughts of negativity and sinfulness, guess what? He has to obey you. Do you remember the story in Second Kings when the prophet, he was in the tent chilling out 
And uh, his servant went outside, and all the, Syri- the whole Syrian army, which was the largest in the world at that time, the whole army was surrounding the mountain. They were looking for Elisha. And his servant come back in the tent. He said, hey, dog, they're out there everywhere. The prophet didn't come out and say, oh, my God, call Benny. Get the oil. And I mean the pure stuff, not the Sam's and Walmart stuff. Get the pure oil. Get on TBN if you have to, but order some. He didn't say any of that. Matter of fact, he didn't go out and look at the enemy. Why? Because a dead man doesn't look for the devil. You remember that singer, he's still around, uh, Randy Travis? He had a song back in the 80s. Digging up bones, I'm digging up bones. Exhuming things that's better left alone. I'm resurrecting memories of the love that's dead and gone. Yet a night I'm sitting alone, digging up bones. And that's what we do. How you doing? Well, I won't be there tonight. No, I'm going to do some exhuming. I'm just going to waller around in what I've been going through. But you all pray for me. Die to it. But Mark, you don't know what they did. Die to it. As long as you entertain it, it is keeping you from conquering that last enemy. Somebody's needing to hear that. Quit entertaining thoughts of defeat. And so what did the prophet do? He didn't pray, Lord, remove the enemy. He didn't pray the enemy would leave. You know what he prayed? Father, let him see it like I do. Because God knows a trial doesn't end when the enemy leaves. A battle is over when the believer perceives it from his perspective. You don't need that thing to end. You just need to see it different and it will end when you don't feed it. See, we've got to get to this place of fearless living. Mark, hallelujah, I believe that. Let let me put it this way. You can't bind what you allow. You can't dwell on something that's supposed to be over and then, well, I bind you right now. No, no, no. The very fact, the very fact that you're giving it your attention is what's giving it life. Because the enemy's ability to operate against a believer are the thoughts the believer thinks. That's how he gets his strength to continue your attention. But die to that stuff. Just die to that thing. Die to that relationship that didn't work out. Die to that thing. And, and can I say this? Be careful. Because the enemy will put people in your life to resuscitate what was buried. When you get too close to dying, the enemy will always bring in somebody who is disguised as life support. Somebody's needing to hear that. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. Well, I just need someone. You need God. That's what you need. When you get content with Him, He'll give you someone else. You don't get someone else and get content with Him. You get content with Him. Oh, but Mark, you don't know what I'm going through. Oh, but He does. I just want to challenge you. We've had death so messed up. We haven't enjoyed life. Well, now that we've heard Mark Shell, boy, that was exciting. I, 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 you know, Revelation, Mark tells it like it is. He tells a story. He says, when I found out that nothing worked, he said, I spoke the old truths. I gave you the religion. I talked about someone else's ministry. He said, what I would do is I would take someone else's ministry, change a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and I preached that. And then I found out that didn't work. And then I preached out of the Bible without revelation, and that didn't work. And when I went to God and I said, God, what is going on here? Why doesn't it work all the time? Why is it 7 come 11? Why do I get one time heal, someone is healed, and then the next one isn't, and the next one isn't, and one is healed, and the one is not? But isn't healing good for all time? Didn't Christ go to the cross for all time? Isn't it present there? Yes, it is. 
it is there. All right, I want to tell you that I'll see you tomorrow. We're going to have Mark on again tomorrow, and he's going to talk about righteousness. We're going to speak of righteousness, that Jesus Christ came and brought us righteousness. He made us righteous so we could have the Holy Spirit within us. This is Dan Hutchins, God321.net. Send me an email, Hutchins at God321.net. And let us know how we're doing on this show. Give us your insight. Tell us how we can improve. Let us know who you are. Tell us what you like, what you don't like. And you can speak about any show. Go to our website, God321.net, and pull up the podcast. And here we are, Detroit. We are out of here. Thanks for listening to God 321 with Dan Hutchins. God 321 is sponsored by Dihydro Services, Inc. To learn more about the person of the Holy Spirit, visit God321.net. That's God321.net. Or call 586-978-0541. That's 586-978-0541.